So we're in a series called Guardrails, which we're looking at the Ten Commandments. And I'm trying to show that the Ten Commandments are not just rules, but they're actually guardrails. Exodus 20. I want you to go to Exodus 23, though, today. We are at the fourth guardrail, and that's in Exodus 20. But I want you to go to Exodus 23. Say amen when you get there. Exodus 23, second book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, amen. So the commandment today is number four, and it's about the Sabbath day. And the commandment itself is in verse eight. You just listen to it. It says, remember. I just want you to hear this word, remember. Everybody say, remember. He says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And then it's the longest commandment of the 10, but he says it again here in Exodus 23. And I want to read, because it's more than a, a guardrail uh, as in just your little life, it's just a, a commandment. It, it's a principle to be practiced by individuals, uh, a community, and even a nation. This is, this is God's plan for this one. All, the first three commandments deal with our relationship with God. The other seven, the rest of the, the commandments, seven, deal with our relationship with one another. And before we talk about how to treat one another, we start with number four, this one right here which is the Sabbath, which talks about taking care of ourselves. What's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And what's the second? It's just like the first. Love your neighbor, watch this, as yourself. If you and I aren't caring for ourselves, how can we care for other people? I don't care how much money you got in the bank. I don't care how many hours you worked this week. How is your integrity doing? How is your character doing? How is your emotional health doing? How is your spiritual life doing? You see, so before he tells us to honor mom and dad, uh, you know, have a good marriage, we're going to cover that. Before he talks about treating your, your neighbors and all of that, you know, no, it starts with this fourth commandment of remembering this principle of the Sabbath, which we don't do in America. And I'm going to talk about it today. Here in 23, verse 10, I want you to look at verse 10. God says, six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyards and your olive grove. Six days, here's the commandment, six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey shall rest, your computer, your car, Whatever it is that you do, and, the, and that your ox and your donkey rest, and the son of your female servant, your employees, the, and the stranger, watch this, underline this, may be refreshed. May be refreshed. You know, sometimes we say, Lord, you, you know, God help me. And we got, you know, I, I know there's chemical imbalances, but sometimes chemical imbalances are attributed because our life is out of balance. And then look at his last verse. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect, pay attention, be focused, he says. And make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. Because when we go on vacation, when we seem to unwind, instead of reaching for the Lord, we reach for other things. There's like this sense of false freedom when we're on vacation. And it's like, man, I got to unwind. And God says, no, 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 no. When you rest, don't even mention other things. I want you to learn how to rest in me on your Sabbath. This is going to be life-changing, church. This message right here, I'm going to take two weeks on. That's why it's that important. And I'm going to entitle this message, The Pace of Grace. And today we're going to learn why we need the Sabbath, what the Sabbath is. And next time we're going to look at Jesus as he modeled how to implement the Sabbath in our life. And this is countercultural in the church, especially us New Testament Christians, because we throw the Sabbath out. I'm telling you, you're going to learn some things today. And I pray, oh God, give us discernment today. Give us a heart to hear today what you would say to us. Help me to teach and preach this, Lord. Give us hearts to receive this today. And I pray this upon your people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Give somebody a high five and say, pace of grace, pace of grace, pace of grace. Thank you, Jesus. So, 
you, hopefully you got a handout. If not, it's on the screen. There's this QR code. You can, you can scan this. Uh, those that are watching on live stream, you can also uh, light, um, hit this QR code. I tried to get, uh, you know, QR outlines for all of these messages, but I don't know. I, don't, I can't promise you that. I was able to get one for this one, and Steve did last week and a couple weeks ago. So because this is so important, I want you to get at least these principles and this, this thing in our heart today about the Sabbath. And so if you're new uh, to the series or uh, haven't heard this yet, what is a guardrail? It's on your outline, but it's also on the screen. The Ten Commandments, we're calling guardrails. And a guardrail is what? It's a barrier. It's a barrier designed to prevent vehicles from straying into dangerous areas. That's why I want us to look at these commandments. And it started with the number one commandment to love God. That was the hanger that we put on the shirts, right? Because when we have a relationship with God, his commandments are not burdensome, 1 John chapter 5, right? And so that relationship is supposed to be established, and then these guardrails are to be put in place. But the Israelites in the Old Testament and many people today look at the commandments as rules. And when you got rules, listen, parents, rules without relationship equals rebellion every time. It's that relationship that we need to focus on. And so they're guardrails. They're not rules or guardrails. That protects us. And so guardrails do two things. They guide us and they guard us. These commandments will, will uh, guide us and they will guard. They will guide us to have a relationship with God and Him alone. They will guide us away from idols that bow down. Remember the Ten Commandments, the second one? We won't make our own version of God because the guardrails guides us to go up the mountain to be with the Lord. Y'all remember that? Amen. Guardrails do that. They help. Sometimes in, in bad weather, you don't know where you're going and your GPS is, is buffering. And, and you, if you've ever been out in traffic, I used to drive a truck for many years and there's times where you couldn't even see hardly past, you know, 20 feet in front of you and uh, because of the rain or the weather or fog and you just slow down. But thank God for the guardrails. They've got the reflectors. Amen. And, and things like that. And guardrails are things that when you can't see God or don't know what to do, these principles that you establish in your life will help guide you when you don't know what else to do. Come on, somebody. They, they, they are guardrails. They guide us, but they also protect us. They protect us uh, from all kinds of wrecking ourselves and bringing damage to ourselves and to our marriage and, and all of these different things. And so there's where we're going. Now let's launch into this one. I was looking back at um, the first message I preached in this. I mentioned a survey done by the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Remember that when they surveyed a thousand Americans and asked how many of them could remember the Ten Commandments versus how many of them remember the recipe to a Big Mac. Remember that jingle? And more people knew how to make a Big Mac than it did commandments. Well, in that survey, and go back and watch this, the very first message, but later in that survey, they also asked and discovered what the least remembered commandment was. First, they asked how many can name all six kids from the Brady Bunch, okay? That was, that, that was the survey. They were like doing these funny things, and I'm just curious. Can anybody name all six kids from the 80s pop show, uh, popular show, Brady Bunch? Amen. So anyway, everyone knows Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Amen. If, if you don't know that, go look it up. But the least remembered Brady Bunch, in case you want to know, kids were Peter and Bobby. <laughs> Yeah, okay, anyway, go look it up. Go look it up, young people. And, um, uh, but ironically enough, the least remembered commandment is this one. Remember the Sabbath day. It's ironic because it's the only commandment that God starts off saying, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And it is, it is hilarious and sad at the same time. All the rest of the commandments he says do and don't. Honor. And, you know, honor. This one he says, remember. Uh, you, you got one job. Remember the Sabbath day. And it's the least remembered in our culture and in the church in many, many times. I have a, I say it's not because it's, it's uh, forgotten. It's forgotten because it's ignored. I believe it's the most ignored commandment. Here's why. We've all grown up in a culture that talks about go, go, go. It associates busyness with success. It, it associates, you know, you know, being a workaholic and always going to being successful. We all experience, I mean, you grow up like that, right? You take a nap, you're lazy. 
if, if you feel guilty or you shame yourself because you take a day off or you take a break, you know, <laughs> some of you don't have that problem. Well, you need to get in there anyway. <laughs> Amen. But even if you're not working, you're still not Sabbathing. And I'm going to show you that here today. We, we just forget about it because we just, and so we push ourselves, listen, we push ourselves until we break ourselves. We push ourselves until we break ourselves physically. We push ourselves until we break ourselves emotionally and, and even spiritually and all these other ways. And we're, we're wondering what's going on. And it's simply because we're not remembering to practice this one thing that God tells us to do. Now, I was watching, listening to last week's sermon. Pastor Steve did an amazing job like he always does. Amen? Amen. Amen. We, we have a lot of things in common. We're brothers. And I, I taught him everything he knows. Amen. And so, uh, uh, no, actually, my dad has taught both of us everything we know. We were privileged to grow up in a, in a pastor's home. Amen. With an anointed father and uncles, and they get all, God gets all the glory through that. But Steve and I, we have a lot of things in common, but we have a lot of things we don't have in common. And he mentioned he likes road trips. He does love road trips. Him and Lindsay, we go on vacations, uh, and we went on vacations sometimes to Florida. And uh, Melinda and I, we're going to fly. Amen. They will drive. Amen. And some of y'all are drivers. Amen. But they, I'm not, I used to be in driving, but when I was thinking about this message, I began to think about this. Uh, I've had terrible uh, road trips. That's why. You know, one of them, I got chicken pox, and I was in the back seat, and that's why I hate Dr. Pepper. That's another story for another time. Uh, but I was thinking of this years ago, Melinda, and I, when we got married, years ago, it was 30 Two years ago, amen, we got married, and um, we didn't have a lot of money. And so thank God for the little cards people give you. So we got some money. We were like, hey, we're going to go on this honeymoon. So uh, her brother, my brother-in-law, and his wife lived in Miami at the time. And so they were like, come on down here to Miami. You know, you can spend your honeymoon. We got all these things that I can show you. You guys can go do your own thing. So we had this plan. And I said, honey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to save money, and we're just going to drive straight through from Detroit to Miami. Now, we're 19, I'm 20, and we're young kids, you know. So uh, I, I can do that, you know. And so we can drive. We love road trips. And so I needed a car, number one. So I asked Dad. Dad let me borrow his Oldsmobile which was a sweet car. It was a newer car, one of the first cars that had the digital dash. When you like, when I turned that on, it was like Kit in Knight Rider. Okay, you remember back in the day, you didn't have, this was new, okay, to, to the thing, and Dad had that car. He said, Eddie, one condition, better not smoke in my car. Well, we smoked in those days, and before we, anyway, so I was like, Dad, you ain't gotta worry about, I promise, no smoking. We get in the car. I said, honey, we're going to drive straight through. Let's leave about 11 o'clock at night and drive all night. When you're young, you get these crazy ideas. And we stayed up all the time all night. We could do it. We were going to drive, beat traffic. We're going to get down there. And uh, so we loaded up the cooler. All I needed was Mountain Dew. So I got like three, two liters of Mountain Dew. Remember that? Right behind the back seat. Didn't drink coffee. Coffee's for old people. And so... <laughs> Again, this is, this is where, I, this is where I, we were. So anyway, we drove, and man, I'm telling you, we drove, and we drove, and we got a couple hours into it. I said, honey, I need a cigarette. And uh, she said, you better not smoke in this car. Your dad's going to kill you. I said, he ain't never going to know. And I rolled, rolled the window down, and uh, confession time, Dad. He... <laughs> so I got, me, got my cigarette, you know, and I, and I popped the, the lighter in, in the ashtray, you know. I'm going to use the lighter. Pulled it out, went to go, you know, light my stogie. And uh, when you don't smoke, you use the ashtray to what? Collect change. So while I had the lighter out, something rolled down inside, and I got the cigarette in my mouth, and I, the whole dash. That's how I, that's how I felt, sister. I, the whole dash went dark. My cigarette went. She said, honey, your dad's going to kill you. So now we're fighting, we're arguing, and... And uh, Dash went up. The headlights were working. Amen. So I, long story short, I ended up having to put a, a fuse in it. Thank God they had extra fuses, and it was, we was on our way. And we drove. We kept driving. We kept driving. We got all the way down to Miami. I took I-75. In case you're wondering, if you take it south all the way to Miami, it takes you 24 hours. You can, you can fly in two. Anyway, you, 24 hours, and you can take I-75 until it ends at a red light. And we did that. We were exhausted. The only highlight of the trip is when we got downtown Miami, along, Phil Collins came on with the air and night. That song came on, and windows went down. Now we're Miami Vice right here. 
And that's every drummer's first love. I mean, right with them drums. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, we were getting, you know, yeah. We were so tired, I actually thought we looked cool. <laughs> we never got to our destination. We were in a little city called Hallelujah, right outside Miami. We had no cell phones in those days. You couldn't text. So we're looking for a pay phone. Some of y'all are having a panic attack right now. <laughs> Melinda had the road map, and she's good at the road map. Like, she still wants us to go on the amazing race, because we, we, that's our favorite, that's our favorite show, amen. And anyway, because she can read a map, and back in the day, so, but we, so exhausted, we got off track, and I ended up looking for a pay phone, pulled up to this hotel, and it was a roadside hotel. I said, honey, we're in e-course. We did a 24 <laughs> Did we ever, I mean, it was, it was just like that, and I was so exhausted. We got in this hotel, and it, we just collapsed. On, it, was, it was, I was looking for crime scenes. You know the little outline of the body? That's how it was. It was really dirty. It was just so dirty. She wouldn't lay on the bed. We didn't even get undressed. We just laid on the bed. She laid literally and slept on me like this. She would not lay on the bed. It was one of them kind of hotel. I don't remember sleeping. I just, I just, just fell asleep for a few minutes, and, and we woke up, and it was morning. I tell you that story because as I began to think about it, I, be, I was reminded, and here's the point. All along I-75 and on every interstate in America, there's these things that's called rest areas. Yes. And these rest areas are designed for you and me to pull off the side of the road, to use the facilities, to refresh ourselves, maybe put some water on your face if you need to, to switch drivers, get you a snack, a snack, walk your dog, and they always have a big map that's on the side of the rest area that says, this is where you are. This is where you came from. Look how far you have come, and look how far you have to go. Can I tell you that the rest area that God has given us in life is the Sabbath day that he's telling us? But what we have done is we pushed it because of our pride and our ignorance, and we end up going and we end up breaking promises to people who we said we wouldn't do. We end up doing things that we thought we would never, ever do. We end up causing damage to the very thing God has given us and loaned us to use. We end up fighting and hurting the people that's closest to us. We end up breaking our promises and getting so fatigued we're off our routine of where we are, and lastly, we end up settling for roadside hotels, places and relationships and things I'm preaching to you this morning, more than what God has got designed for you and for me, not because we're not smart, not because we're on the right road, but simply because we push it too hard and we ignore the warning signs and we walk in the flesh and not after the spirit and we wonder why it's taking so long. How did I get here? Why do I feel this way? Why is it this working in my life? And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, River of Life Church, it's because of this. Simple principle right here. We are not slowing down. We are not abiding in the Lord like we should be. This isn't a religious thing. This is a spiritual thing. Spending time in the presence of the Lord and not pushing ourselves to go. This is what I'm talking about. Sabbaths are God's rest areas that you and I need in our lives. When you see it like that, light should come on. And we don't like Sabbaths because we're a New Testament church. And we think the Sabbath is not relevant to us. It is very relevant to us. The early church practiced the Sabbath. Jesus practiced the Sabbath. In fact, when he was asked about the Sabbath, and here's the scripture I go to in case you're here with us and you're wondering about the Sabbath, uh, why are we in church on Sunday and not on sa Saturday and what that's all about? I'm going to try to clear that up here uh, as we go. Here's the command. Here's what Jesus said about the Sabbath. It's on your screen. It should be in your notes. He says in Mark chapter 2, and Jesus, when he was asked about the Sabbath, he says, he says this, the Sabbath was made for man and not man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. I want you to see that. So he says two things in this scripture. The last verse is simple, is powerful, is this. When you have Jesus Christ as your Lord, you fulfill the Sabbath. That's what he means. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. 
And when Jesus is your Lord, the righteousness that you and I in the Old Testament would gain by honoring the Sabbath, the righteous part of it I'm talking about right now, is they would earn it by practicing it righteously. Jesus says, you don't earn righteousness, I give you my righteousness when I'm the Lord of your life. So the fulfillment of the, right, of the Sabbath, in case you're wondering, is, all, is fulfilled spiritually and righteously when you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. But it's the first part of that verse that we New Testament Christians overlook. And he says, I want you to see it. He says, but the Sabbath was made for man. God said, I made the rest area for you that travel. Jesus never said, throw the Sabbath out, you don't need it. No, no, no. He said the Sabbath was created by God. He, was, he created it for man. The religious Jews made, made a law out of it rather than the heart of it. They missed the whole heart of it. And that's what many of us have done in America and in Western culture where we don't practice this thing. And I've been trying to get this into our church, this whole thing about abiding in Christ. That's going to be my last point there, but this is where all this is coming from, right? You have the works tree and you have the fruit tree. Remember that? The whole thing is about abiding and you can't abide if you're too busy running. We're going to blow right past those opportunities. You ain't going to be in practicing no Sabbath. The things that drive us is, is money, food, and entertainment. That's what drives America. That's Western culture right there. Money, Food and entertainment. Those are all blessings of God and should be enjoyed in this right uh, order that God has given us. But they are not to rule our life. So I want you, if this is on your notes, I want you to write this down. Sabbath is not necessary for salvation, but it is necessary for spiritual success. The Sabbath isn't necessary to be saved. But if you want to have spiritual success, which is another way, what, how do you define success? We'll get into that later. Because success isn't in numbers. Success isn't in how much money you got in the bank. Success isn't how many toys. What's that bumper sticker? Whoever has the most toys wins. I mean, that's the culture that we live in today. It's more, more, more. I got to have the latest phone. I got to have the most followers. I got to have this. So we work ourselves. We go this, 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 because we're trying to gain that. That's not success. We want to be used by God and be fruitful. We got to have a Sabbath. Sabbath also helps us, watch this, to keep work and money from becoming idols. That's why God said, I want you to practice the Sabbath every week because you'll, you have a tendency, we have a tendency to make the almighty dollar and work a God in our lives. What is Sabbath? Sabbath is actually a Hebrew word, Shabbat, and it's made of two words. And these two words are, the first one means to stop. Everybody say stop. The second word means to settle in or to dwell. The idea is like when you arrive at your Airbnb or your hotel or grandma's house and you unpack. You got two kinds of people listening to me. When you travel, you live out of your suitcase. The other group, you may be like me, I unpack my suitcase. My family makes fun of me all the time. And I, I hang shirts up, and I don't care if I'm there for two nights. I'm going to hang stuff up. I'm going to put stuff in the, in the drawer, in the dressers. You know, you're going you're gonna to forget stuff. No, I like to do it because it kind of makes me feel like I'm going to stay a while. Right? That's the idea, the concept of Shabbat, of Sabbath. We're, we're going to listen, hurry, this ain't in your notes, but you'll learn this. Hurry kills intimacy. Spiritually, you're trying to have a conversation with somebody. You're trying to get, you know, intimate. You're trying to talk with someone on another level. And if they're looking like this and they're in their phone and they're in a hurry, what happens? It kills everything. And that's why God said, I need you. You need to practice this Sabbath. What is a Sabbath? This is the most important uh, part of the whole message right here. The biblical Sabbath, are you ready, is a 24-hour block of time in which we stop Enjoy rest, practice delight, and contemplate God. Those are the four principles, and we're going to break them down today. Now, what day that you practice a Sabbath, many, first thing you go to is your day off. But this is what we do in America. We work, 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 and then we go to a vacation. And we, we many times need a vacation from our vacation. Anybody else like that? I know we are. We run everywhere. We got to be like, honey, I need a vacation from that vacation. Because that's our, that's our work the, the way that we go, we run, run, run. We end up going, going, going. But a, a uh, Sabbath is a 24-hour block of time. And I, I know you're going, I can't do it. Well, hang on. 
Now, the Jewish tradition, of course, they did it every Friday evening when we were in Israel. And I used to have a route in the city of Southfield here where we have a huge Jewish community. You could go there on Saturday and everyone's walking uh, to the synagogue. The Jewish people are because walking, uh, driving a car would be work. To me, I think walking is work. But anyway, well, hey. hey. But, uh, so they still practice the Friday evening until Saturday evening is Shabbat. When you're in Israel, you have to prepare for this. You see the grocery stores and the market is just buzzing with people and they're preparing. And, and those of you with kids, and we're going to get into this with families because I know you're thinking, I can't stop. Listen, you incorporate Sabbath and the purpose of Sabbath into your family days, into your days that you have. And uh, this is what a Sabbath is supposed to be uh, really all about. So they would even get treats that they would only be able to eat on Sabbath so the kids would look forward to it. I mean, there's, a whole, there's podcasts out there. There are books out there. I just watched a podcast on how to craft your Sabbath when you have littles. And it was a great, it was that one couple, they're real famous on TikTok, forget his name. Before TikTok was around, he was on Vines, and this guy was really the spoken word guy, that dude. Anyway, look him up, him and his wife. Um, they do an excellent job in teaching that. So, but anyway, so that's the Jewish tradition, but the resurrection day that Jesus rose from the dead changed everything. How many know resurrection changed everything? And so what happened was is the Jewish people would always use the Sabbath as their church day only. But when Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the early church in the book of Acts, and you can read it for yourself. I'm not going to show you all those scriptures. You will find they begin to meet together to worship on the first day of week. That's why we have church on Sunday and not on Saturday. However, the principle of a Sabbath is something that the New Testament church and Jesus still practice, and many still practice today. We practice it today. And uh, it doesn't have to be on Friday to Saturday. Many of you can include it on Sunday because you're already in church. Um, however you do it, Paul the Apostle writes in Romans chapter 14, it's not on your screen, but he says, one may observe one day and make it greater than the other. Paul says, no one day is greater than the other. So let no, one, no man judge you on your Sabbaths. So there's not a day that's, you know, scarier or better or bigger or nothing. Paul says, you can pick that day as New Testament. Why? Because you got Christ living in your life. So you pick that day that you have that you want to uh, do that. Um, did you know that America, I, had, I looked this up in one of my classes I took and I had to go back to it, and it blew my mind. You know, America used to practice the Sabbath. All the way back from George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, all the way up until World War II. World War II changed everything. That's when we first were introduced to the seven-day work week. And we had to, because we were in war. I mean, all the, all the machine shops and plants were converted over to make machinery and artillery and military equipment, rightfully so. But the problem was, is after the war, we never went back to the Sabbath. What happened was retailers began to jump on, and the seven-day work week was then established. That's where it came from. And, and, and watch this. I, I was looking this up. Ironically, or not ironically, but consequently, starting from the 1960s and 70s, after war, the Sabbath principle became a thing of the past. But with the decline of the Sabbath, America saw a significant increase in emotional dysfunction, juvenile delinquency, and divorce. It hit our society, it hit the family, and it hit marriages. Why? Because we were never intended to drive straight through. And I know this isn't shouting, running the pews, and running around kind of a sermon, but I'm telling you, this is a game changer. If we would learn to implement a time that we spend with the Lord more than a five-second prayer or, that, you know, that were these little things. And many of us already practice it and things like that. I'm trying to get it into our culture and see that it is a huge guardrail that has been removed in our culture and even in the church culture today, and we're run, wondering why we're running on E. We end up hurting the people we love and the people closest to us and by us, destroying things, as I said earlier. Why? Without rhythm and rest, society begin to unravel. So it doesn't matter on what day that you choose to have a Sabbath. Melinda and I, we try to practice it. Uh, now, there's a book out. We've been getting it into our leadership, and I've mentioned it to you before. Starting around 20, 
19, right before COVID, I began to read this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Now, you guys, many of you know about it. Um, I got some of our leadership in our township reading that book. It's amazing. It's a great book, and it talks about this Sabbath. Now, he's on a, another whole level. I'm just going to tell you that. I'm not there yet. I'm getting there. But this guy went and lived with the monks for about a year and learned how to sit in silence, you know. And this guy, is a, he's an Italian uh, man and his family, and he brings in the genogram, and because of the Italian family and the culture that Italians have, and he's real funny, and he talks about it, how it was so countercultural for him to learn to shift his life around this Sabbath thing. But he hit a wall in ministry, pastor in a very large church in New York. His wife looked at him and said, honey, I am never going to your church again. I don't want to be in your church. I don't want to be a part of your church. You become mean. You're offended easy. You're touching no one can talk to you. Your family don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. And this guy had an emotional breakdown, battle and depression, anxiety, and on and on, all because he wasn't in sin. He wasn't out here on the internet. He simply was ignoring the rest areas in life. That's why I'm telling you, man. This is why I believe we have so many moral failures. We got so many people, Christians, that don't have victory and so many problems. And listen, we can pray and preach till the cows come home, man. But until we learn to abide in Christ, We'll never see the fruits flourish in our life. Amen. Come on. Thank you. And we won't learn to do that unless we practice the Sabbath of what they are. Uh, so we try to practice it on Sunday after church because I'm not resting right now. This isn't rest for me. My mind is, I mean, it's Friday and Saturday. The whole is, is sermon prep and, and things like that. So we try to go Sunday after church and after Sunday afternoon to Monday afternoon. I enjoy football, amen, and that's a family time, and I'll tell you about that here in just a moment. And then Monday evenings, we're starting to work and prep for the week. I usually get a sermon ready for Life Challenge Tuesday morning chapel or a huddle, a meeting, marriage council. We start planning, our, getting our week ready, boom, boom, boom. But Sunday afternoon until Monday afternoon, and, and being a part of like a pastor, and many of you are like first responders, that's not always possible. And I've been called on emergency calls with some you know, issues here in the church or with our community. So we, I'm flex, I have the schedule where many times I can move it to another day. But you got to guard this Sabbath is what I'm trying to tell you. you got to learn to guard it the best you can. Life happens, I get it. Time happens. Again, it's not a legalistical thing. It can't become a legal thing. It has to be a thing that you notice and you are a good steward of your time, your emotional health, and your, your walk with the Lord. Man, I don't know if I like this message, Mabel. I don't know if I like this message, Mabel. Tell the person next to you, you better listen to that man. No, I'm just kidding. You better listen to the word of God. So you, you pick a day that you want to do this on, and it works for you. These are the four components, and I want them in your notes. I want you to get them right. Now, this is, and, it, and it's different than a day off, and here we go with it. Number one, Sabbath is first and foremost a day of stopping. I want you to know that it's a day of stopping. Everything God created has a rhythm. The sun goes down. It comes up and it goes down. The moon had the tides, uh, everything. Everything has a, has a rhythm. Everything God created has a rhythm. Seasons, we're entered into a season, a fall. How many fall people we got here? Amen. I love fall. Amen. It's a season. I love summer, but it's a new season. And that is God. And he says in Genesis, as long as the earth will remain, these seasons will always remain. Seed time, harvest time. I mean, these are everything God created is designed to operate in a rhythm. You and I are the same way. You and I are to operate in the same kind of rhythm. And it starts with this rhythm of stopping, learning to stop. Everybody say stop. The word Shabbat means stop. It means to just slow, not slow down. It means to stop working. I know we can work from home. We can work on emails. We can work, we can work so much around. The, and your brain, you know, many, uh, many theologians have called this the, uh, the, the day of spiritual warfare. They call this uh, because it's, it's something that's countercultural to your body. It's countercultural to the way you think. We want to go, go, go. And it's going to be more of a burden than, than it is a delight. But I'm telling you, it's something that you got to ease yourself into and, and you need to stop. First thing people say is, I can't afford to stop. That's the very first thing. I can't afford to stop. I got too many things going on. I got too many things going on. Well, God promises, as he even said to the farmers, listen, if you will trust me, 
and you will trust me and take a year off. Do you know this was agricultural rule that was supposed to happen? Some farmers even practice it, and some of you with your gardens will practice it. You have a garden every year. When we used to garden, I used to garden every year. I gave it a year off, and I'm telling you what, that next year that soil was produced better crops than I ever seen there in my little garden there in Melvindale. Amen. I even had a watermelon. Couldn't get a watermelon to ever grow. I mean, these are principles that God told the whole society to practice. And, and it was it cost effective. People were afraid, man, what's it going to cost me? And I looked at companies that begin to trust God and say, God, I'm going to trust you with them. One of them is Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is said this. He says this quote from the, the CEO of Hobby Lobby years ago when they first were established. He says, we have chosen to close on the day most widely recognized as a day of rest, watch this, in order to allow our employees and customers more time for worship and family. This has not been an easy decision for Hobby Lobby because we realize that this decision may cost us financially. Can I tell you, I just looked this up, Hobby Lobby is the world's largest privately owned arts and crafts retailer in the entire world. What do you mean? How is that possible when you take the busiest shop? I was in retail for 15 years. Sunday, everybody's getting their shopping down. Everybody's out there working. You know, that's the day where people are out there shopping. And here it takes a guy that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and not worry. I'm going to give God that first day of the week. We can shout amen to, to like I said, to the Costco moment. When we start living this stuff, really demonstrates and, and, and the terror that we, that we are feeling when I say stop exposes the shallowness and our need because we're so empty. Did you hear that? The terror that, that we think of when you hear about stop, it just reveals how much we are empty and how much we need it. I could go on with Chick-fil-A. I looked up Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A was also in the fast food industry. They um, said, we're going to take Sundays off. Same reason. That's why people and Christians always talk about Chick-fil-A. You may like Popeye's. Popeye's red beans and rice is second to none. I'm going to tell you that right now. But, you know, chicken sandwiches, I, I, I love Popeye's chicken now. It's pretty good. But I, I like to go to Chick-fil-A because I love to support these businesses that stand for biblical principles like this. And so that, that's why it's not a big, you know, thing. If you eat Popeye's, hey, God bless you. Or McDonald's. You, you better. Amen. Churches. Okay. Uh, but watch this, watch this. Uh, Chick-fil-A, one of the restaurants, one of the restaurants averages $9 million in, in uh, income. That is more than what a single McDonald's and Taco Bell combined make. <laughs> Both of them make 3.5. McDonald's makes about 3. Point, they have more restaurants than Chick-fil-A. And Chick-fil-A is number three because of that statistic. But financially, store to store, Chick-fil-A is second to none. I'm just trying to tell you that when we honor God and we say, I'm going to take a step of faith. I know it may cost me a little something, but I'm going I'm to trust you anyway, God. I'm going to trust you anyway, Lord. I'm going I'm to practice this as much as I can, God. And I'm going to let you deal with everything else, God. And I know no, no, this is crazy, but I'm going to say yes to you. And I'm going to spend time with you. And I'm going I'm to honor your word and say, God, have your way. I'm telling you. I'm Listen to me. Listen to the stats. God will honor his word. God will honor his word. Amen. One of the reasons why we didn't go to a conference this weekend, and our superintendent would be here next week, so don't tell him. But our staff was overworked. We had that meeting. I said, listen, this, this thing's coming up. And everybody was like, man, we're just so, we had all these things that we just were going through, and many of days off. And I said, that, and had family stuff planned. And I said, you know what? Your family comes first. Take it off. There'll be another one. And we heard playing dodgeball. Some of them didn't even do that. That's fine. Whatever you got to do. You got to learn to, to guard that day of, okay, so you stop. Sabbath, I like what one guy said in the book. He said, it's like the gift of a snow day if you live in Michigan. <laughs> Stores are closed. Come on, Donna. Roads are blocked. She loves snow. You know, I love snow days because there's no expectations, amen. No obligations, right? No responsibilities, right? No school. Come on. If you're online, the internet don't work, right? <laughs> Nobody's asking you for nothing, right? It's a snow day. What, you get to just relax. You can binge watch Lord of the Rings or Rings of Power. You can sit and watch, uh, you know, sports, whatever. Read a book. Take a nap. Play with your kids. That's what a Sabbath. Every week, I'm telling you, people that practice this, it took us a while, but, man, I look forward to my Mondays. 
I look forward to my Sunday afternoons and my Monday mornings, man. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, when you start building this in your life, number one, it stopped. And it really, here, here's we start turning the corner. Number two, once we stop, the Sabbath causes us to rest. Now, this is different. This is where it starts to di differentiate between a day off. Because many of our day off, days off uh, are just running, just as crazy, running and gunning. Are, are you resting? Resting is something that God said, I want you to, you work six days. You run six days. I need you to rest. Tell the person next to you, rest. That's why we, the older you get, how many know the more you appreciate a good night's sleep? Come on, somebody. Amen. I used to drive to Miami. I would sleep in a car. I could have, I've slept in all kind of weird places. But that's why we spend so much money on mattresses today. When you get older, you go, how many of y'all can appreciate the value of a good night's sleep? Let me tell you something. When you get older serving the Lord, you know why I'm preaching this to you today? Because I've been in ministry now for, I've been your pastor for 11 years. I've been in youth ministry for 11, so 22 years I've been in ministry. Watch my dad finish strong, and I just want to finish well. You should have that same thing that you want to finish well. When you are, I love, my life verse is, is Acts when Paul said that I don't count these things uh, to stop. Nothing will stop me, but I want to finish my ministry with joy. You can finish things, but how many want to finish with joy? He says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish the assignment that God has given me and finish with joy. Well, I'm telling you, it's time that we as a church and a people begin to build some margin into our life and to build a rhythm. And that's what I'm getting to, a healthy rhythm of life. COVID changed us, man, and we're not going back. We haven't went back to where we are. People are so on edge. It's a political year, and it's, people are walking in the flesh all the time. I'm telling you. Then you got some of us who can walk right through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't really care why I got that peace that abides within me. Why? Here's the secret. He said, I'm your good shepherd. I will make you lie down. I will make you lie down next to green pastures. I would rather willingly lie down than the shepherd make me lie down. Thank you, Debbie, for that word. The Lord wants to pick those birds out, but we keep running. You see how that word lines up? We keep running. We keep running. God says, I need you to stop. I, I, I need to kind of groom you a little bit here. I need to get pour some oil over your head. You can't be pouring oil over a sheep when he's running over here. God, anoint me. Anoint me for this. God, why ain't you moving in this? And God said, who are you? What, what's going on? There's a danger in doing ministry for God and not with God. You, you got the seven sons of Sceva that, that tried to do ministry for God, but they didn't even know God. And that demon spirit said, Paul, I know, because he's been stopping in these rest areas and recharging. I'm afraid of Paul. Jesus, I know, he was the Sabbath, but who are you? You ain't nothing. You ain't got no authority. You ain't got no confidence. You ain't got no anointing because you're spending it on TikTok. You're spending it on video games. You're spending it on chasing the dollar. You're spending it on this. You're running on this and you ain't got no anointing for me. Sit down. What you going to do to me? That's Pastor Eddie's translation. And the Bible says that demon-possessed man jumped on all seven of those priests and beat them down and sent them in the city naked. Why? Because we get humiliated and defeated when we're walking in the flesh and not following after the Spirit. Why ain't this working? Because you ain't got no anointing. How come you ain't got no anointing? Because you ain't spending time with the shepherd. That's all I'm saying today. I'm not trying to add another religious, what's he trying to do? Don't he know we're a New Testament church? You want that anointing? You know how you get the anointing? You got to willingly spend time abiding with the shepherd. There ain't no, when the church in Acts, oh, here we go. When the, when the church in Acts was growing and they were expanding in chapter 6, you think God gave them a break and said, hey, you're the early church. I'm going to cut you some slack. You don't need no Sabbath. You don't need to read your word. Come on, Pastor Eddie's always talking about, you don't need to read your word. You got bills to pay, bro. You got to take care of your family. Run. You keep running. No, did God say that? No, in Acts 6, he says, you better stop because you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Come on, somebody. He says, you better give yourself to reading and spending time in the Word and slow down and delegate some of that authority and that anointing because your anointing is drying up and you got no power to push it through. 
Hallelujah, that's what I'm preaching here today. We gotta get a rhythm and that rhythm is not to sit still and just look at the wall. That rhythm is to be with Jesus. Some of you got that book I gave you, Practice in a Way. That's another way, uh, another book I'm giving out. Many in our leadership, our awesome uh, Belleville City Manager. I don't know if he's, Jason's here today. Hey, man, we got him one, a copy, and, and other ones, man. And they're and texting, man, they're, and they're saying, I need this, man. And what is, it, what is it all about? It's about spending time with Jesus, man. Right. And, and abiding in him. So resting. Where was I at? Snow day. It's giving yourself permission to play. It's giving yourself permission to play. Then resting. Once you stop, you got to rest. Yeah, because practicing Sabbath protects us from practicing stupid. Practicing Sabbath protects us from practicing stupid. I don't know about you, but we do stupid things when we get tired. You'll eat anything, you'll say anything, you'll behave anything, you'll try to pop a cigarette lighter when it's full of coins. You'll revert back to some old patterns because it's easy. And you can get serious, step out in your marriage, blow a good opportunity. You know how many opportunities I blew in my life, had opportunities to do something in my life and I blew it because God was not a priority in my life? Here's the serious side of it. Jesus says this in Matthew 12. He says, when an evil spirit goes out of a man. Now, I'm not going to get into this because... This is another whole teaching, but I just want you to pull one little principle out of this that I want you to see. He says when an evil spirit, when evil comes out of people, when people start coming to church, playing dodgeball, oh, these people are kind of cool. They come to church, they hear about Jesus. I can relate to that man, what he's saying. And you ask Jesus into your life, Jesus comes into your life. You start getting cleaned up and you start, or you are have a demonic thing and an issue going on and whatever. But Jesus says when evil leaves a person, he, well, watch what happens. The evil spirit says... Well, if I had time, I'd unpack this because spirits are not just what you think. They have intellect. They talk. They speak. They're real. They're real. You get so tired, it'll tell you, won't you just take your life? What did Jesus say? The enemy come to steal, kill, and destroy. Where did you get these thoughts from? It ain't from God. Jesus says that evil spirit, when he leaves, he ain't happy. Because he's got to go through dry places, watch. And then he says, he comes and he, he comes back. Oh. He comes back to where he came. I'm going to check on, they've been going to church now for a minute. I want to see how they're doing. Bring a little temptation and see. I'm going to, you know, get them, troll them a little bit on TikTok. Let me get, let, let's get a little advertisement where she looks a little sexy. Because it's always a pretty girl with a nice body that's always going to be advertising foot cream. I don't care what it is. <laughs> I don't care what they're advertising. It's never going to be someone who's not attractive. The enemy ain't never going to tempt you with something you can't be tempted with. You're working too hard. Your buddies will text you, hey, we're at the club tonight. Hey, we're at the bar tonight. Hey, we're doing this. An old romance will come back around right at the right time. Am I speaking to anybody in this church today? I'm telling you, the evil will come back. Oh, I got to finish this. He come back, and here's what he's looking for, ladies and gentlemen. He's looking to see if there's some room for him to slide back in that DM. What does he say? If he finds it empty. Empty. Circle that word. Put a blinking light in your Bible if you can. Jesus said, this is the problem. You've been going to church, but are you still empty? You come in a Bible study, you go in a Bob Dodge ball, Bob ball, every other ball you got. Amen. But are you how you doing spiritually, bro? Are you empty or full? You've been stopping in those rest areas, or you just, I can make it. I don't need Jesus. Pastor Reddy feeds me on Sunday. That's good for a month. See you next month. I'm trying to help us. Jesus says that evil's gonna come knocking on the door. And when there's emptiness there, you're gonna be like, okay. Gotta, gotta forgive me. God will deliver me. And this is why we don't understand why the other prayer didn't work like the first time. Because he said he brings seven more spirits more wicked than him. Watch this. This is Jesus. This is Jesus talking. New Testament. Spirit-filled people, listen. And he says, and the last state of that man is worse than it was in the first. So shall it be for this entire generation. There's going to be a generation of people, Jesus said, that's going to end up being just like this. 
That's why I got two weeks to go on this message because there's a lot to talk here about it. Rest. And now these last two really separate a day off from Sabbath. Stop, rest. The third component revolves around practice and delight. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here. How many's with me? You with me? Here's where we don't do this. We think a day off is just not going to work, not going in the office, ignoring some emails. That might be part of it. But here's the part where the healing doesn't come unless you do this number three, and that is practicing delight. That is, what did he say in the text we read? If you do it right, you'll be refreshed. There's where the refreshing comes. You have to be able to know the things that bring you joy, that bring you, recharge you, energize you, things that will fuel you. This is why he said, and if you got family, this is where you bring the kids in, and this is what makes it a family day and things like that. I mean, he says, you need to find those things that, that bring you joy. I remember when I went through this class, when I was getting ordained, I went through this class, and it had a couple of pages on it, and it told you to, to write down things that uh, charge your marriage that you like to do together as spouses. And then write a list of what charges you because you need to have an individual outlet and inflow as well, individually. And I, I struggled. I wasn't into hunting again. I kind of gave up on hunting. And I remember sitting down and thinking, man, I need, and I could not even write. It wanted me to write 10 things. Can you write 10 things that bring you joy and charge you? Why? Because we're always giving. We're always going. Many parents, listen to me today, this is, this is what God has sent me to tell you today. You, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt the people that you love the most. The thing that you're working for to help, you're actually doing things in reverse. You're doing more damage than good. Because at the end of the day, how many know our spouses and our kids and our loved ones, they want you. They want us. So you got to be recharged. And, you know, for us, it's, it's Melinda and I, we like nature. We like to be outside. We like to go for walks and hikes. We go for walks about every evening and together, and we love to do them kind of things. I love football. Amen. That's just my thing. And she lo she's a foodie. She loves to eat foods and has me eating all kind of foods. Amen. But she loves foods, and, and this is where the healing comes. You remember during the lockdown of COVID where we weren't allowed to go nowhere? <laughs> but do you know the, the few good things that did come out of that? Do you see what happened to the waters that we have, like the rivers and lakes and things of Venice and that dolphins were returning for the first time. Why? Because we were doing what God told us to do in Exodus 23. Take a break. But why? Why, why don't we do that? Because of greed. Ain't no business is going to stop in Venice. They get paid to boat you around in that beautiful romantic city. Amen. Ain't no business going to take a break. We run, run, run. Push, push, push. Now, I'm not getting on, you know, tree hugger or nothing like that. I'm just telling you, we need to be good stewards. I'm telling you, there, this thing works. Okay. Practice and delight, practice and delight. What are the things that charge you on your day off? What are the things that charge you on your Sabbath? What, with me, it's family also. I love to be around family. We're going to have family dinner today and being around my grandkids. and We love it, man. It just re, what, what recharges you? And lastly is contemplation. This is what makes it holy to the Lord. Come on, give me three more minutes. How many going to give me three? This is what makes it holy to the Lord and not a day off. When God stopped work, he turned around and he looked at what he did and he said, this is good. Yes. What's he doing? He's looking back at his past week. It, that's the rest area when you look at the big giant map and you go, look how far you've come. Part of a Sabbath is for you to stop and reflect on what God done for you this week. We don't thank God for hardly nothing. We're always asking for something else. We're always focused on how far we got to go. Listen, that's okay to have a goals and stuff. But the Sabbath is when we stop and we recognize what God has already done for us. You know what this does? It helps train us because we need to be trained in gratitude. It helps us to train and recognize and to recognize the goodness of God in our lives. How many's picking up when I'm laying down? Come on, I need, I need, I need some feedback. Y'all quiet. You guys are quiet. He looked back after his six days and said, thank you. I'm, I'm able to enjoy my Sabbath because of what you've done for my sixth day. What you did during the six days. We don't, it's not taking time from God. It's we draw closer to God. 
this is that vacation thing. When we're, oh, we're, on, we're down on vacation, we're going to get turned up. There's like a freedom. I'm on my way. You know, I'm away. God said, don't you be doing it. We just read it. He said, ah, listen, this is the most important thing I want you to remember when you, when you put these guardrails in is to keep me first in your life. And here's what I'm telling you. When you keep God, I said it so many times, when he is the joy in the center of your life, it enhances all of life's pleasures. When the lions win or lose, I'm a happy man because I got the joy of the Lord. Come on, I'm just, I'm just being real. I'm just being, well, that sunset is beautiful. But when you know who made that sunset, when you got a relationship with the one who put that in the sky, it makes every, you look at that and you go, wow. Everybody else is like, well, it's just a sunset. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? When your kids are crawling and walking, there's babies and little thing. My little grandson come up to me the other day. He, we, he now, we're trying to get him to say football, but he says basketball. So he's, he's, uh, he needs some anointing. He's some deliverance. And so, okay, I'm closing with this soon. And he goes, and this is what he's learned to say. Papa, he calls me Papa. I'm supposed to be Poppy, but he calls me Papa. Papa, I love you. Oh, come on. Isn't that good? You know what makes that a cherry on top is when no one prompts them. The other day, I wrote this in my journal. It was that big of a deal. He was sitting on my, on my lap. We was watching football. It was a couple of weeks ago. He turned around. He grabbed me by my face, and he said, I love you. He said, Pop, Pop, I love you. Man, I'd give you a million dollars if I could make him do that every day. You know what I'm saying? I want to close with this. This is what I'm talking about, what a Sabbath is. The last thing Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm going back to heaven. And Rome is going to come down on y'all big time. Two things. Number one, don't be afraid because I'm sending the helper. <laughs> Woo! I'm not bringing stained glass windows and an exercise. I'm bringing the helper. Uh, he's going to be, he's been with you. He's going to be in you. Come on, somebody. I'm going to bring you a helper, another person just like me. And he's going to be with you 24-7. But here's the thing I need you to remember. He said, here's the second thing. You need to learn to abide in me. John 15, he says abide eight times. What is he doing? Abide in me if you'll bear much fruit. You can't do nothing unless you abide in me. Stop that at those rest areas when you're driving, when you're taking kids to school, when you're changing diapers, when you're about to lose your ever-loving mind. You got to make some time for me. You got to stop and look back on what I've done for you. Talk to me. Let's build on that relationship. He was giving him a pattern, a guardrail. And you know what? They followed it. And that we're sitting here today because the 12 men said, yes, I will do that. Even if it costs me my life. Even Dalton Thomas, who is, he gets a bad rap for one weak moment of his life. How would you like to be identified for the rest of your life for one weak moment? But Thomas said, I will go. And he went to India. We have in, the Indian nation is now serving the Lord because of one Jewish man that said, I will honor the abiding in you. I will put a guardrail. And I will watch my life and my emotional life and my relationship with you, God, is number one. Even if it costs me my reputation. Even if it costs me whatever. Yes. On and on and on and on and on. So what I'm giving you today, worship team, won't you make your way to the platform. What I'm giving you today is a framework to build rhythm into your life. Some of you are working too hard, man. You, you just didn't, you're, you're losing it and you're waiting for some magic sermon or something. Listen, it's not, man. I believe in prayer of deliverance. I believe in healing. Boom. I believe in being set free, but I also believe we got a responsibility to put some guardrails in our life. Guardrails in your marriage. Guardrails in your, your emotional health, dude. Listen. We used to rebuke, if you had emotional health, you don't need no counseling. You got the counselor. Amen. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. The Bible says where, is there, where there is no wise counsel, people are, are destroyed. What does he say? All that stuff about, the, and the Holy Spirit is a counselor. And what, he, what is he going to tell you when you slow down and listen to him? You're going too fast. How many know that, you know, God has his own time? How many's learned that? <laughs> We're in the microwaving, he's in the marinating. I'm just going to tell you that right now. That's just what he does. That's just what he does.
Abraham, 25 years. Isaac, 20 years. Jacob, you go down the list. If you're waiting, you're in good company. Sometimes the waiting, he's going to intentionally make you wait because he's trying to build in you a reservoir and something that you can draw off of, which is called the Sabbath, this abiding in him. And if he can't get you to stop, he'll, like I said, as a shepherd, he'll make you lay down next to the green pastures. Family, you got kids. You're like, man, how do I do this? And I, want to, I wanted to really help parents because I know I watch my daughter. She's in kid mode with Elias James and Carolina Grace, and she does good to make it through a night. I know how that is, changing diapers. And you get that book and, and things. There's whole chapters dedicated to that. But I'll just tell you this. You simply make your family day and your time together. You, you make sure you, you connect God in your whole thing. What, what is the most valuable prayer in the Jewish culture? The Shema, Shema. Deuteronomy 6, God says every Jewish person remember, memorizes this verse. Remember, O Israel, hear that the Lord thy God is one. And watch this. And you shall love him with all of your heart, mind, body, and soul. Watch this. And you shall impress this upon your children when they rise up in the morning, when you walk along the road, when you talk in your house, when you lay down at night. That's Sabbath. Family day of a Sabbath should look like this. You get up and you go to the zoo. That's amazing. That's a great day. You know what you ought to do? Look, God made that. God made everything you see. What you're doing, you're teaching your kids something that, man, only you can teach them. You spend a time in the Lord, you're telling your kids what God has showed you, and on and on and on. Hallelujah. This is living at the pace of grace. Would you stand with me today? I know, it's, I know some, you heard it, you're just not going to do it yet. You're, you, I'm just being honest. I know, I'm realizing that. I'm a very optimistic person. I sometimes too optimistic, but I know some of y'all be like, meh, I already got a day off. Some of you are going to try it, and some of you are already there. I want to encourage you that are already there, keep doing it. Keep going. Keep going. The other two categories, start implementing it. Look at your schedule this week. You know, I had another pastor, we were talking about this, and I said, man, what do you do, man, if you got a call in a church, someone in your church, their marriage is failing, and they call you on your Sabbath. He said, honestly, their, their marriage was probably failing for six months, and they haven't reached out to you yet. And he says, you can't help them, every, you know, unless you're in a healthy place. <laughs> this guy pastors a very large church, and he's very, very successful in what I would say successful, because it's the ones that know him the best respect him the most. That's success. Did you hear me? Those that know you the best, respect you the most, that's success. And the only way we're going to do that is if we love God with all of our heart, love our neighbor, but watch this, number one, love ourselves. You got to take care of your emotional, man. You got to take care of the emotional health of yours. And I'm not talking about, you know, all this other weird stuff. Spend a time with the Lord. Talk to some counselors. Whatever it is, we live in a crazy day today, man. Emotional health is driving people, it's breaking marriages, but people are doing stuff they don't understand why they're doing it. And I'm telling you, it comes back to this. Spending time with God and abiding in His presence. So hopefully I gave you a framework where you can start building on it. Stop work, rest, practice delight. What brings you joy? What brings you happiness? Find those hobbies again. Do them together as a family or a spouse. And number four, contemplate God. Bring God into it. So you gotta have God, it starts with Him. And then you work out of that. Like, I'm ready. after t I'm empty. I'll be empty. Don't talk to me after service. If you do, I say who knows what. So I'm sorry if I ever talk to you after church and you're like, what did pastor just say? Because I'm kind of empty right now. <laughs> I mean, talk to me. You know what I'm saying. So I kind of rest up this afternoon and tomorrow, but I'm already looking forward to next week. I already know what time. I'm ready to face it. Now I'm not. I'm tired. Same way with you. You work from your Sabbath. You don't run to your Sabbath. I can just get to the vacation. And that's how we do and vacation's cool. But this is a rhythm. Everybody say rhythm. A rhythm like the sun and the moon, man. You got to learn to get this rhythm in your life. And I know it's countercultural, but I'm going to keep preaching it until we get it in here, man, because I want to see you flourish. I want to see you be fruitful in every area of your life. And it only is going to happen if we're abiding in Christ. And we're only going to abide if we make time for him. So, Lord, I thank you for your word today. God, thank you for, it's not just an Old Testament rule, but it's a New Testament practice. 
We're saved by grace through faith, but Lord, we, un- we thank you for that. We honor that. We understand that. But Lord, you've given us the practice of Sabbath for our health. And I pray, God, everybody would listen and hear and receive this word, the heart of this message today. Help us to continue to be a healthy church as we get these healthy rhythms in our marriages, in our families, in our ministries, in our jobs, in our careers. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Hey guys, Pastor Eddie here. And I just want to take a minute and say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to find our YouTube channel. I don't know if it was recommended to you by a friend or you was just searching. Somehow you come across our our YouTube channel. And I believe it's God. I believe it's God's design that led you here. And I pray that these messages have impacted your life. You know, as a preacher, I always pray, God, I don't want a sermon, I want a message. What do you want to say to your people? And I pray that and have prayed that for years, and I, that's how I pray my uh, messages. So I hope and pray that they've impacted your life. If so, will you do me a favor, do two things. Do one is just comment below or reach out to us and contact us and let us know. Also, hit that subscribe button. We get more traffic, the more subscribers we get, and more people can come across and find these messages and find the message of hope in the gospel through our, through our uh, YouTube channel. Also, if you've got a prayer request, we've got a phone number you can text your prayer need to. It's 833-235-5760. So let us know if you've got a prayer request and somebody will be praying with you right away. Again, I want to say thank you for taking the time. Hopefully this message has impacted your life. God bless you. We'll see you next time.